What's happening, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Noah, and if you couldn't tell by this beautiful backdrop, the day of the week or the guy on screen with me, this is Triple B, Bunk Bed Breakdowns, BDGE's very own dynasty show. And I've heard through the grapevine that LeVar Ball is actually a little bit jealous. We found out like how to brand a Triple B as well as we did. Um, he might have something in the works, but that's just hearsay. But as always, every Wednesday, I'll be joined by my co-host, Mike, at MikeMeUp on Twitter. How are you doing today, Mike? What up, big dogs? <laughs> what an entrance. Love that. Yeah. Today, we're going to be diving a little bit into what Mike did this offseason, talking about touchdown regression at the wide receiver and running back position. Some guys that may either accrue value by positive touchdown regression, some guys that may have the regression spike negatively and completely destroy their value, and we might dispel some myths. Some guys that just because they scored three touchdowns this year doesn't mean they're going to score 15 next year, and vice versa, because as we all know, Football is an extremely random game, but some players are extremely terrible and their ankles are even worse. So we'll get into that specific player in a little bit. I'm sure you can guess who it is, but without rambling on any further, let's hit that intro. Let's kick it off. Um, before we get started, you'll know, see my new mic setup. I'm so uh, mad. You sound so I'm, professional. I'm over here with this thing. Let me see. It's uh, like a ball. I went to face. Twitter, sought some advice. Shout out to uh, Big Dog favorite Scott, our video editor. He told me to invest in a shore mic, and uh, I did. Did that for you guys because we freaking love all you guys out here at Bunk Bed Breakdowns. You can't join us on the bunk bed, but we'll try and bring our sexy voices to you over the over the airways. Um, but with nothing else to do, let's kick it off. Um, so just to, just to give you a little bit of background, I really wanted to dive into regression because I think it's a topic that everyone talks about, but no one really understands. And to be quite honest with you, I still don't understand it even after spending so much time on it. And I think generally speaking, though, people oversimplify what regression means, right? Like, like Noah, like when I say regression, like, what do you think of? I have like flashbacks to my statistics course that I took in high school, and I just don't want to revisit those memories. Yeah, exactly. I mean, people just think like <laughs> when people say regression, I think the first word that most people think of is like average, right? So let's think about, you know, what is the average and how do people regress to the average and regress to the mean? Like that's probably one of some of the most common terms. But, you know, I think what you'll notice from from some of us, some of the talk that we have at Big Dog is like, look, we want to try and understand like specific cases, right? Because football is such a small sample sport that trying to apply like widespread averages and statistical models, although it sounds sexy, I just, you know, I just don't think that's like the right way to think about things because at the end of the day, some guys are just good at football, man. And you hear, you hear us say that all the time. Like we can't just simply assume that everyone's going to be average because that's how you miss out on the elite guys. And that's who, the guys who give you an edge. So that's like the foundation of my analysis. It's like one, my, I assume that there are elite players that exist and they're better than the average, right? And some players will have better situations, which allow them to excel beyond the norms of what others are able to do. And three, it takes time to regress, right? It's not something that like, you know, you do good one year and next year you're automatically trash, right? Like if you look at guys like Marshall Falk, who people compare Christian McCaffrey to, that guy didn't hit his stride until he was 25 years old. And he kept that stride until he was 29 for like four years. That stretch is when he was best and most productive. So are you saying Amir Abdullah is a breakout candidate? That's oh, hell yeah, dude. Amir, Amir Abdullah 2020-2021 campaign is coming strong to Love a theater that. near you. So get on top of that real quick um but i want to break this down by numbers and you know Noah will throw up some of the tables so you guys can follow along with us uh but i could basically create a, like a three-step process to break down regression into its separate components so the first component i looked at is td dependency and what this means is like how dependent on are these guys are uh, how dependent are these guys on their tds to achieve their positional ranking so for example uh, you know, Aaron Jones, right? The prime regression candidate. If you look at the chart, you'll see that Aaron Jones is finished as the RB2, but if you excluded his TDs, he would have been the RB10 on a points per game basis. So obviously it's a big drop off. So TDs is a big part of him. And the reason why I want to do this is because I want to identify guys that scored a lot of TDs that are really dependent on them to hold that positional ranking, right? And if you look at this chart, it'll tell you that Mark Ingram, Todd Gurley, Aaron Jones, and Derrick Henry are the most TD dependent running backs that finished in the top 15, while guys like Leonard Fournette, Alvin Kamara, Miles Sanders, and Austin Eckler were the least dependent on their TD ranking. 
And then step two is when I want to look at the TD distribution. And the reason why I want to look at TD distribution is because we know that the closer you get to the goal line, the easier it is to score, right? It seems like a simple concept. I haven't really quantified it before. Um, and no, again, we'll show you the table. But basically, when a running back gets a carry inside the five, he's two, almost two and a half times more likely to score than getting a carry inside the 20. So most people think about red zone carries in terms of like that entire red zone. I like to break it down in terms of separate components because it's like huge difference between getting carries and the value yeah, of carry from the 19 three. isn't equal to a carry from the three as we'll break in like we'll get into a little bit later but obviously a 19 yard touchdown run is probably a lot harder to get than a three yard touchdown run exactly so when i looked at this what it told me was that austin eckler derrick henry nick chubb saquon barkley and miles sanders are potential regression candidates without concerning anything else just looking at the numbers and it's because they're scoring an abnormal percentage of their touchdowns from outside of 20 yards, uh, which obviously, you know, some guys can keep it up. Barkley's a God. We'll see, you know, thunder thighs maybe allows him to keep it up. But in the long run, that's like an area where I think, you know, it's potential for regression, right? And no this pun is intended. kind of that was a good one in the long run. Yeah. yeah I, didn't, I didn't even intend that. You get a mic and you start switching up on me. It's crazy. <laughs> um, meanwhile, guys like Zeke, Mixon, Fournette, Cook, and Chris Carson scored – primarily all their TDs within the red zone. So from that perspective, their TDs are more sticky because as long as they keep retain that red zone role and the goal line role, you'd think that they can repeat it going forward, right? And this is kind of where like most people stop. It's like, look, big breaks and like lots of TDs, they must regress. And the most common metric I see is like comparing it to yards. And I get that, but I think the most important step is to look at red zone efficiency. And what that means, like how good are they at converting when they get into these money situations, right? And if you look at this graph, uh, what you'll see is guys like Aaron Jones, Derrick Henry, Mark Ingram, and Todd Gurley show up again for, posit for potential regression. And you'll see some common names, and those are the guys we'll get into later. And then meanwhile, other guys like Leonard Fournette, Nick Chubb, Alvin Kamara, Barkley, and Sanders, they're achieving at below the average of the top 15 in terms of converting red zones. And does that mean these guys are bad at scoring red zones? I don't know. We'll, we'll explore that a little bit further, but this kind of gives me a framework to see like identify guys to dig deeper on. And that's what I want to do. And this final chart is just like a little table that you'll see. It's a summary of all the names and whether they're negative, positive, or no effect in each of those categories we talked about. And I think now we'll just kind of get into some of those names and kind of provide some more backstory into where we think they're going to go, where the ADPs are, and then, you know, what Noah and I think in terms of a buy, sell, or hold. Yeah, so first off, we're going to start with Aaron Jones. And Mike, if you want to just explain the touchdown numbers, because I don't have it in front of me right now. But just a quick overview. Um, it's basically that Aaron Jones, all three years he's been in the league, despite missing games, despite not always being the lead back, he's been extremely efficient and extremely productive when inside the five, inside the 10, what have you. He's proven to be one of the best goal linebacks in the NFL. And I'll put the chart on the screen to prove those numbers. And of course, this year was extremely extremely positive right he scored a ton of touchdowns from inside the five inside the ten he had a high conversion rate but to write him off just because his numbers were so high without looking at his previous production like when you compare his numbers to the average you realize guys like Alfred Blue are in the average <laughs> guys who can't like they don't have knees they don't have eyes I don't know why they're on a football team there's no reason to compare them to the average you should be comparing them to what they were in the past on a case-by-case -case basis and obviously a lot of these guys as they continue to play in the NFL they get better at football. They learn their offense a little bit more. And we saw that exactly pan out with Aaron Jones, who's running behind what I believe was the sixth highest graded um, offensive line per football outsiders in adjusted line yards. And that definitely showed because every time they were inside the five, you have a guy like Devonta Adams there. And I know he was hurt for a lot of the season, but practically every time they were inside the five, it was just the Aaron Jones show because he is that good down by the red zone. And Mike has the numbers to back those up. And for me personally, when it comes to dynasty value for a guy like Aaron Jones, there are certainly a lot of negatives that surround him, whether it be him being a free agent after this next season, the injuries he's, he's sustained throughout his career, whether it be knee or hamstring related. He had a suspension here and there, or one suspension. I wouldn't hold that against him. It's a one-time thing, it seems like. And on top of that, the offensive line, I think they only have two starters signed through 2020. So you could have concerns that, you know, if they're going to pay Aaron Jones, can they afford to pay those offensive linemen? If they want to pay those offensive linemen, can they afford to pay Aaron Jones? But what it comes down to is what Mike said earlier. Some guys are just good at football. And Aaron Jones is probably going to get signed to another team if it's not Green Bay. We see guys like Deion Lewis and Jarek McKinnon get absolute bags for no reason. 
there's no reason to not give Aaron Jones, a guy who is not only a good enough pass catcher out of the backfield, he's an actual weapon in that department of the game. He's lining up at receiver this year. He has shown an innate ability to find the end zone, no matter the situation, no matter his role in the offense, he's extremely productive. So in terms of buy, sell, hold, I'm not so sure what your stance is on this, Mike, but for me personally, if I own him, I'm probably holding him because there are these negatives surrounding him. Like the common consensus is that he will regress in the touchdown department. I don't think, like obviously he's not going to score, what was it, 20 touchdowns again? He might score, you know, 12 to 14. But with what he's done in the passing game, with what he gives you on the ground efficiency-wise, 12 to 14 touchdowns is still a running back one. So the price you're probably going to get for him isn't worth giving up. And to buy him, there are enough negatives surrounding him that if I'm trying to build for the future, I probably don't want to invest in an Aaron Jones and I might just rather take the price that it would have costed to you know, acquire him and use that to build my team. So me personally, he's yeah. a hold and he's not a guy at all I'm worried about just tanking to have like a six to eight touchdown season next year. Yeah, yeah, he's a hold for me too. And, and I'll, I'll get into numbers here. But Aaron Jones historically in his uh, 2017 to 2018, he was actually more efficient in the red zone than he was this year. So inside the 10... Inside the 10, he was converting at a 66% rate compared to this year at a 57%. And part of that is because he just got more volume, right? Like in 2017, 2018, he only got 12 carries combined inside the, inside the 10. In 2019, this year, he had 19. And that just goes to like how much of an idiot Mike McCarthy is, right? Because every time they got, into the, they got into the red zone, like this dude was just throwing a fade. It's like, oh, a fade to Adams, fade to... Graham, who like can't even jump anymore so michael gallup stonks are through the roof i love yeah that. exactly so i think you know i think that part of it is like it's just him getting more volume and now you're seeing him prove that he's really efficient on that volume so he's converting to, to touchdowns so i'm a, i'm on the same position as you aaron jones is a hold for me he's not he's not this like panic cell that everyone's trying to make him out to be his current adp is uh running back oh, 11. yeah running back 11 so he's a back end running back one he just put up an rb2 season he's a really really good football player right he's basically alvin camaro without the media coverage before this season he's used in a very similar way where he's not given a ton of touches but the touches he are he is given are extremely valuable i believe he led the league in deep targets for the running back mm-hmm. position this year so that gives you chunk yardage rogers missed him on a few of those he's used on the goal line he's used in the passing game he is yep. in the perfect situation to produce for fantasy purposes. Yep. So we're both a hold on that. Um, next up, candidate Alvin Kamara, arguably easily one of my favorite players in the NFL. Love to watch him. Uh, you love to see it. Um, and this year he kind of underperformed, but not to the degree that you think. If you go on Twitter, you like it feels like you know Alvin Kamara like banged someone's mother. You know, like everyone's just hating on him like for no reason. I and think after that dude- animal shirt rip, people expected so much out of him, and he kind <laughs> oh, yeah. of disappointed. Yeah, look, I had Alvin Kamara as my first one too, and he was disappointing. But when you dig into it, he's not as disappointed as you think, right? He still finished as the RB9 overall and the RB8 on a points per game basis in PPR formats. Yeah, so, PPR is RB12, so it's not that much of a discrepancy. Yeah, exactly. And if you look at his touchdowns, he's grossly underachieving historical averages. Uh, his historical average is about 35.4%, and he converted this year at 21% inside the 10 And historical average inside the five was 48.1%, which is basically every time he got, every other time he got a carry, he was scoring a touchdown. And this year he was 37.5%. So he's below by 14 and 10% total on both those rushing touchdowns. And the reason why I look at this is because if we've seen him do it before, we know that he can do it again, right? There's people love to comp to averages, but like what's the best comp for a player other than that player themselves in another year? There's no better comp, right? So that's why I like to look at it this way. So if he does rebound in the touchdown department, then you're looking at like top five upside. And New Orleans Saints still have the first ranked, number one ranked uh, run blocking O-line per football outsider. So look, I'm all in and people might be afraid. They say, look, Drew Brees might not be back. Well, you know what the splits are with, with and without Brees? With Brees, you're scoring about 20.3 points. Without Brees, he's 19.75. So half a point per game. I literally don't that's care. Good. That's so, going to lose you a week one of these days. Yeah, no, but I completely agree with you on Alvin Kamara. We look at what happened this year. And I think it all comes down to his high ankle sprain. We saw the exact same thing happen with Saquon Barkley. I put a tweet out. Yeah, another God. I'm not going to put it on the screen because it was earlier in the season. and I didn't do it for the entire season. But it was basically their yards per touch, each one of these guys from their rookie season until they sustained that injury compared to, you know, when they sustained it. And from there on out, their yards per touch decreased by like 1.2 each. And I know that's not a significant number, but for being a guy who is like 
typically extremely efficient on his touches to going to like a mediocre number, you have to realize that there's probably a confounding variable there. And it has to be that ankle. And I know a big part of working around the end zone, and I don't want to get like all film grindery on you guys, but like a lot of that has to do with burst. That's why a guy like Aaron Jones is extremely efficient down by the goal line. He puts his foot in the ground, he puts his head down, and he scores. We've seen Alvin Kamara do it, as you said, for two straight seasons. It's not like he had one outlier year, and then after that, you know, dipped down, he went back up, he dipped down again. He was consistent for two straight years in a really good offense. Not much has changed. I will say for this offensive line, they only have two guys signed through 2020, but for as long as I've known the Saints, they've really prioritized that position. They traded Jimmy Graham for Max Unger a few years back when Jimmy Graham was basically in his prime. So I think that they would shell out the cash for him, especially if they're not going to bring back Drew Brees to a long-term deal. They don't have to give a lot of money to the quarterback position, especially if they invest through the draft. So basically everything is shaping up for Alvin Kamara. And the role he plays, and I touched on it with Aaron Jones, is like he has the perfect role for fantasy football. He's caught exactly 81 passes these past three years. And considering it was like a partial season this year and his rookie year, he wasn't really the guy until like week four, week five, and he's still splitting a backfield. The potential is there for him to catch, you know, 95 to 100 passes. Like guys like Saquon Barkley, guys like Christian McCaffrey, and on top of that, if you want to just look at the raw red zone numbers that he saw this year and compare it to Latavius Murray, you might be a bit wary, but you have to look at it on a per game basis. Latavius Murray had 23 red zone carries. 13 of them came in those games when Alvin Kamara was sitting. So obviously a little math right there. He only had 10 in the however many games. Alvin Hold Kamara up. Let me played. check that math. Do it. Yeah, you got it. Love that. I'm so good at this shit. Uh, <laughs> so that's basically less than one per game. And for his goal line carries, carries inside the five. He had three on the season. Latavius Murray did. Two of those came in games without Alvin Kamara. So Kamara has that job locked up inside the five, locked up in the passing game. And I realized I just called him Kamara and Kamara at once, and nobody would yell at me. I'm all in on him. I'm not going to make any enemies. I'm buying. If somebody wants to send you Alvin Kamara for the 101, take that and run, because you're hoping the 101 becomes Kamara. You don't know DeAndre Swift's landing spot. You don't know if it's going to be Swift, if it's going to be Akers, if it's going to be Dobbins, if it's going to be Taylor, who has the best landing spot. Whoever it is, the best case scenario is Kamara. If you want to, you know, give up the 101 and a little bit of a later pick, I'm fine with it because we know this guy is a top five running back when healthy. Is that the bunk bed breakdowns lock of the week? I think we can lock that up. I think up. it's the lock of like the next five years because again, the it's dynasty. You have to, you have to, you know, set a little bit of a cushion like a yeah. pillow on a bunk bed so you know <laughs> right away. Yeah, definitely. Lock it up, boys. Just buy them. Just don't overthink it, man. This guy's a stud. Next guy. Uh, next well, up. Before we, uh, before we announce his name, I want you to put in the comments if you know who we're about to talk about, and I'll give you a hint. We're not fans. All right, that's enough time. <laughs> uh, Max Animal, freak athlete, Derrick Henry. Word associate. Uh, Love that. So you know from the last episode that we're not too high on Derrick Henry, and I kind of alluded to it, but his TD regression signs are not good. So – I think he has potential risk both from a TD distribution perspective in terms of where he's scoring. So he's scoring a lot from outside of the red zone as well as a TD conversion uh, perspective because he's uh, achieving above the average of the top 15 and he's achieving above the average of his own historical pass. So all those things kind of point to potential regression there on top of the team level regression in terms of the red zone efficiency of the Titans as a whole, which we touched on. Like I said, they scored on 31 to 32 trips, which is just, absurd that's just not going to happen again um and then you know as noah mentioned last time he had a bunch of tds from penalty flags so oh i got got something for you i'm digging because i knew we were going to bring this up the guy had seven carries on the one yard line he scored on six of them four of those that he scored on were on the back of penalties in the end zone that advanced the ball to the one yard line so of course he's going to score when you're six foot three 250 pounds and you run a four or five i hope to god you can score on a one yard run but then again You know, Ryan Tannehill's probably going to be back going into his second year. Defenses are probably going to know a little bit more about him this year than years past because they thought he was basically Marcus Mariota all over again when he really was an efficient quarterback this year. So obviously there's going to be some offensive regression there. And on top of that, how often can you play the luck game and hope he gets the ball down on the one-yard line? If he does, he's probably going to score because he's a mountain of a man. But the chances that he has that many opportunities again, you have to rely on that for him to basically produce what he did this past season to return value at his dynasty price, if you're hoping for all of that, I wouldn't hope too much because that is basically best case scenario is what he did this past year and paying the price it's going to take to get him is wishing upon a star and Derrick Henry is not a star. Yeah, yeah, I would say, look, I would sell him and I would look for something in the range of 
you know, 1.04, 1.05 your rookie draft. So you can kind of get one of those stud RBs or even like a stud wide receiver. Um, and based yeah, on some of the flex, you can push that back a little bit too, because the top two yeah. quarterbacks can be off the board. We just heard that Tua is medically cleared for, I think in a month, he'll be ready to like do drills and stuff. So, yeah. you know, basically and know your leagues, man, like, like some, know right. your leagues. Some people, you know, value rookies the more higher and some people value studs higher. And like, based on some of the interactions I found on Twitter, like some guys aren't even willing to give up Henry for the 1.01. So, you know, just know your league and just kind of explore and see what's out there. I will always trade down for, for youth if I think, you know, I can get something back. Yeah, and another thing about Derrick Henry, too, is a lot of people are talking about him potentially not being re-signed in Tennessee. I think that's a prime reason why you should sell him right now because say he does get re-signed in Tennessee, how much higher does his value go from now until then, right, or from thereafter? Yeah. If he goes back to Tennessee, he's not going to move up from – you know, where, wherever his ADP is right now at the RB9, he's not going to go to a top five running back because he's brought back to Tennessee. If he lands in somewhere else with a worse situation, let's say Miami takes him, his ADP is probably going to fall and you're not going to get as much in return. So take yeah. him and sell him while his value is still high and while people are still willing to pay the price for him. Yeah, exactly. Next up, this is the one that uh, Noah kind of alluded to in the intro, but it's uh, Lenny, man. Lenny Fournette. Uh, what are you going to do with him? I, I see on the sheet that you have him as a hold. For me, he is a buy because I think people may have forgotten this dude's injury history. I haven't heard about it in a while, and I'm no doctor, although you know, I've been in college for Sorry, a couple years. Sorry, you say he's years a now. buy? No, uh, sell. Oh, okay. I, I about to say, you, say, you said he's a buy, and then let me tell you about his injury history. <laughs> it's like, dude, you're not going to be a great salesman. <laughs> terrible. Like, Here's terrible. his house. Let me, uh, let me tell you about the guy that got murdered in it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you about the ankles that got murdered on the bottom of his <laughs> legs. Yeah, the injury history dates back all the way to college. He played one full season. He hasn't played a full season since 2012, you know, prior to this year. And I think that's kind of being overridden by the fact that he was a decent fantasy producer this year. And I say decent because a lot of his production came off the back of pure volume. The dude had 365 opportunities this year, 265 carries, 100 targets. What are the chances he sees 100 targets again next year? Sure, the offense is devoid of talent uh, receiving-wise other than like DJ Chark and you know, they have a couple of promising young tight ends that have never done anything. But the chances of him getting 100 targets next year on top of his touchdowns repeating to what they were earlier in his career, which even then weren't all too impressive, again, similar to Derrick Henry, you're really wishing upon a lot for him to return value. He's currently the RB8, similar to Henry again. I would sell him for the 101. I'd sell him all the way down to like the 106 or 107 because you're getting a guy who not only doesn't have the injury history um, in those top picks, that you would get out of the 104 to 105, whatever. You're also getting somebody who has a longer shelf life and you're getting somebody who isn't going to be a free agent after next year. Leonard Fournette is only in contract till the end of next season. And what's to say that they bring him back, right? What is he doing to help them win games? Absolutely nothing. The dude was suspended for skipping picture day. That should tell you enough about how committed they are to keeping this dude on the team. They have a lot of other holes to fill, especially the offensive line, which was terrible this past season. There's no reason to pay Fournette. And what are the chances that somebody else is going to want to pay a guy who's been banged up throughout his entire career, who, when given the opportunity, hasn't been efficient, who practically hasn't been good, hasn't been on the field all too much, has shown he's decent in every part of the game. And just touchdown-wise, we touch on, you know, him regressing and him hitting, you know, the positive regression, scoring more touchdowns. I found some, like, random stats that are absolutely absurd. The dude hasn't scored a touchdown from further than one yard out since – November 25th of 2018. It's been a full calendar year since this guy <laughs> took two yards, two steps for two yards and found pay dirt. It's been two years since he scored a touchdown from further than five yards out. It was October 15th of 2017, the last time Leonard Fournette scampered for five yards and found pay dirt. I don't want that on my team. People always talk about him breaking big plays. When's the last time he scored a long touchdown? The dude gets gassed. You know, he has terrible bursts. Then he gets through the line of scrimmage and he's fast as hell for about 42 yards. And then he's out of breath and he's calling for his trainer to stretch him out like at midfield. This year, he had a game where he ran for 69 yards on one play and he ended the game with 66 rushing yards. That game was that hilarious. disgusting. I don't want that on my team. I'm selling him at all costs because like any cost, because you want him to repl replicate exactly what he did this past season and have positive touchdown regression. And I'm just, I'm not buying in on that. There was way too many factors there for me to not be excited about Leonard Fournette. All right. I love the big dump he just took on his face. Uh, <laughs> let, let me provide some, some, some numbers for some of this stuff. So he is the picture perfect candidate for the positive regression to the average stance. Okay. 
all the guys that say, look, he has so much yards. He needs to like, he's going to regress to the positive. He's going to regress to the mean. And here's why I think you need to pause. Okay. When I look at Leonard Fournette and I look at his historical averages, yes, it does say that because historically he's scoring at 50% inside the five, right? Going back to his rookie season, he converted at 60% within the five. So he was a beast in his rookie season. I think that's what people are hanging on to. But what people aren't considering is that his O-line has been deteriorating drastically. And along with his drastically deteriorating O-line, you see those percentages come down pretty dramatically. So in 2017, which is his rookie year, Jacksonville was a top 13 O-line. They were ranked 13th out of the NFL, right? He converted at 40% and 50%. In 2018, or they ranked 21st, and then those percentages dropped to 35% and 45%. This year, they were ranked 27th. So they were a bottom six uh, in the league in terms of their run-blocking O-line. And as a result, his conversion percentage dropped to 13% and 37% inside the five. So honestly, I don't see that percentage inside the five to really go back up because his O-line is trash. I can see the inside the 10 converting up a bit more, but as Noah just said, like this guy has no burst. Uh, looks like he's running in quicksand sometimes. So from that perspective, I would really pump the brakes on the Leonard Fournette's going to score a bunch of touchdowns next year. Um, and then the other part of it is this dude had 100 receptions. I mean, sorry, 100 targets. And he's not a weapon in the receiving game, right? He's just someone that you dump off to. And as much as I love Minshew, he did a lot of that this year. And if they do add talent through the draft, which I expect them to do because your second receiver is DD freaking Westbrook, who sucks balls. Um, Jesus. You kind of... me hitting on Fournette? That was a little rough. Dude, this guy was... I, I did not understand the obsession with DD Westbrook this offseason. It made cool name. no you sense. You gotta like pencil that in for at least like a one 1,000 yards. I, I guess, but it may, but he's just not good. I, I, like why bet on guys aren't good? Anyways, I digress. But I think there's a couple of things, right? Like if they add weapons, I'm, I think you're going to see a fall off in his reception and target volume and the TDs are, I don't think are going to make up for that because in a PPR format, like that's a ton of points, right? You're giving up. And even though he's not getting much yardage afterwards, it still kind of adds up. So I think that even if he positively regresses on TDs, he's going to take negative regression on target volume. And you're going to see a decline kind of like what we saw with Zeke, right? What happened with Dallas when they added Amari Cooper and Gallup took another step forward. If you know, Jacksonville adds another wide receiver and Chark take takes another step forward, you're going to see that fall off. So for me, that's why I have him as a hold because I think it's an offset. And I'm not really putting as much weight into the ankle injury because I did see him play a full season. So I'm not dinging him as hard as you are. But, you know, for sure, if you have the opportunity to sell for like a one point, like a top four pick, I'm definitely doing it. I'll swap him out for one of the top running backs in a heartbeat. Yeah, I've just seen people ranking him on Twitter as a top five dynasty running back. And when you have guys like Joe Mixon, you have guys like obviously the top three or four guys and a bunch of others, you know, even rookies coming into this year. I just think that's way too high for somebody who, you know, you have to rely on him getting signed to a new team or having Jacksonville pay him this upcoming offseason. And I'm just not so sure that's in the cards for Leonard Fournette. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll knock out a couple of these other running backs pretty quickly because there isn't as much to cover. But next guy, I know you love him. Uh, Chubster, what do you think? Yeah, he's a buy for me. I mean, we obviously see that he didn't score many touchdowns this year, and I think a lot of it has to do with Freddie Kitchens. Worst goal open. line play calling of all time. Remember that game where he had like four attempts from the half-yard line? He I'm just sure ran out the like gut eight. four times. He had like three, and then they like threw it on fourth, and there was a pass <laughs> interference, and then there was like three more, and then <laughs> yeah, they threw dude. it again. It was, like, it was pretty much showing how incompetent Freddie Kitchens was, and like his job security went down every single time they ran the ball. But yeah, he's he's just a really good running back. There's no other way to put it. The guy was like top five in yards created. He had more yards after contact than all but 12 players had total rushing yards this season. He had over a thousand yards after contact. And I know they had a decent offensive line. That just shows me if something does happen and then the guy in the offensive line gets hurt, the guy's going to produce no matter who's in front of him. Baker Mayfield didn't have a great year. The offense as a whole wasn't great. Yet the guy, I believe he was second in the league in rushing yards when Kareem Hunt wasn't there uh, over the first, like, I think it was 10 weeks. He was on pace for 64 targets, which obviously that number is not going to, he's not going to probably attain that number this year with Kareem Hunt probably being back for a cheap price. But they bring in Kevin Stefanski as their OC. And he's a guy who used the running backs, especially heavily through the passing game. Um, they had a 28% target share last year. And obviously Dalvin Cook's a better pass catcher than Nick Chubb and Alexander Madison is pretty good through the air. But let's just say like the team throws 30, 34 times, 35 times a game with a 28 to 30% target share out of the backfield. That's like, 10 and a half, 11 targets. 
Even yeah. if Kareem Hunt gets like six or seven of those, there's still room for Nick Chubb to at least have a decent enough floor, see like 40 to 50 targets. And that's all you need because that's an he, important point. I think like, you know, people are worried about Kareem Hunt and everything, but the key thing here is Freddie Kitchens is fucking gone. Like that's the key. They gave him the freaking boot as he deserves. Like there's that really hilarious video of like him, like tickling Baker, like underneath the chin for some stupid reason. And Baker's like, that guy's an idiot. And I was like, this, <laughs> this is so true. <laughs> like, he's so dumb. They have but, that video of like that white lady on the phone with the police trying to call out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think like the key to understand here is I think the pie is going to get bigger. So even though Chubb is splitting it with Hunt, you have a bigger pie, so they're both going to get more volume, so it's good for both of them. I think that's a key point. Yeah, Stefanski and other stats, they attempted the fifth most rushing yards per game, and obviously Minnesota is more catered towards the run for as long as I've seen them. They're an extremely run-heavy team, but when you have Nick Chubb and you have Kareem Hunt out of the backfield, sometimes things switch up, and with, especially with a new H, uh, head coach in there and Kevin Stefanski, there's probably going to be more attempts to be had, more passes out of the backfield to be had, and Nick Chubb is the clear-cut goal line back, and I know down the stretch, Kareem Hunt, you know, ate into some of those carries, but there'll probably be more volume to go around there because the offense was so bad last year. You know, another year with everybody in that system with Odell there, Kareem Hunt there, that offense is probably going to positively regress, have more scoring opportunities, probably limit some turnovers for, for Baker as he gets more comfortable than actual coach back there, extend some drives. Just Nick Chubb has proven to be an elite fantasy back despite a lot of things working against him, whether it be somehow Carlos Hyde starting in front of him, in front of him as a rookie or Freddie Kitchens at the, as the head coach this past season. A lot has been negative for him, and he has still been a top 10, top 5 uh, running back for fantasy purposes. He's still extremely young. So, yeah, and the offensive line there was pretty good, and they're all signed. I believe three out of the five are signed through 2022. So there's longevity and continuity along the line, which I think is a huge plus when you're talking about any type of running back. Yep. Cop that buy button guys. And, uh, you know, I was on Twitter today. I put out a tweet about, you know, if I were to use my rookie picks, who are the players I target? I didn't even put Chubb on there because I think he's out of the price, but like people responded and being like, I wouldn't even give the 1.3 for Chubb for whatever. So, you know, if you can give a single rookie pick for Chubb, I'm doing it because people are hoping that Jonathan Taylor turns into Chubb. And yeah, just that's his like pro comparison at yeah. his ceiling. You and can literally get Chubb for that price. So go out there, throw out some buy offers, see what happens. Next up, we're going to have a guy who's kind of old, you know. Um, we're going to talk about Mark Ingram. And Mark Ingram actually had a great year. Uh, some people wiser than me actually had him as a buy going to the Ravens. And the Ravens are a super run-heavy team. So, But I'm really worried about him in terms of his TD uh, regression because he overachieved in both rushing and receiving. Like his conversion percentage was completely unsustainable. Um, and Honestly, if I can sell him for any first, uh, which might be a bit rich, maybe you can sell him for like a second and a bit more, uh, or maybe just swap down for a younger asset. Like I actually traded him in season for Geis last year after Geis went down. And I'm not even the biggest Geis fan, uh, not because of talent, because of the situation, but I feel like trades are that like that are pretty good ones to make. Yeah, that age disparity, it's what, like six or seven years? If, even if it takes guys two years to really ramp it up, you get a much longer shelf life than what you're getting out of Mark Ingram. I have Mark Ingram as more of a hold just because if you have him, it's probably because your team is in win now mode. And I think the package you get in return, I know those examples you brought up, I would definitely take like a Kenyon Drake for him or a first yeah, round pick. Yeah, another great one. I just think the return you're realistically going to get probably won't match that. So if you're not getting good offers and you're, set, you're selling him for like a late second, early third, and you're in win now mode, I'd much rather just have Mark Ingram, who's in an elite offense, who, you know, he didn't, he wasn't a clear workhorse back. He did lose a lot of carries on the goal line to whether it be uh, Gus Edwards or Lamar Jackson. But I think this is a good enough offense and he's shown enough efficiency as to where I can have confidence in him being like a back end RB2 for me next season, maybe the year after, because he signed for two more years. So if, if nobody's really feeling, if nobody wants to accept any offers for Mark Ingram and you're having trouble selling him, he's going to be similar to a guy who we're going to touch on later in Julio Jones, where you might as well just ride it out. I think the value he brings to your team is a lot more than, you know, the potential return you can get. But as Mike said, if you can get an early second, a uh, late first, if it's a super flex league, maybe even push that to a mid second because talent falls. I would definitely take that. But, you know, an aging running back is pretty hard to sell in Dynasty. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? Like, you don't have to try and sell it now because rookie picks are really at the heights. The best time to sell veterans is in season. So once you have shaped out like who's going to make the playoffs and that guy really needs that like one extra piece, put him over the edge. That's when you can get like next year, second, even. So mm -hmm. you could even hold till in season. Uh, next guy is Todd Gurley. And this is like, the last running back that we'll cover. So for me, Todd Gurley is an interesting case. 
I would have expected his red zone efficiency numbers to come down because the Rams overall have taken a complete dump. You know, boy genius Sean McVay has proven to be not boy genius. I guess he's proven to be more like boy average. Uh, if I could put it that way. Just a young Yeah, yeah, Freddy just Kitchens. just a young young Freddie Kitchens. And the Rams last year, number one ranked run blocking no line. This year, nineteenth. Right. So given all the circumstances, you expect his efficiency to come down. That's not the case. He's actually achieving at above his historical efficiency under Sean McVay, which is a frightening statistic to me because I don't know if that's sustainable. Like their O line is just not very good. And we've covered this on before, but like Les Sneed is like a kid in a candy store maxing out his credit cards. Like they have no future picks, first round picks until like 2022. Their salary cap is in an awful position. So it's going to be a challenge to bring that O line back. So Todd Gurley for me, you know, I would say he's a sell. And if you can get like a 1.08 to 1.10 range, that's a good return for him, but it's also a tough sell. So at the same time, you know, you want to sell him, but he's still an RB too. So if you're a contender, I'm also fine with holding him if you can't get like a first for him because I'm not going to sell him for a second. Yeah, and as we've talked about throughout this entire video, it's important to compare a player to their past production. But with Todd Gurley, so much has changed, whether it be the offensive line or his health or just how he's looked on the field. He hasn't looked nearly as explosive as he did in years past. So comparing his numbers to the past and them being higher than what they were when you should expect them to be a lot lower is concerning for his touchdown production. You look at what he did this year. Nine out of 14 touchdowns came from inside the five. 12 out of 14 came from inside the 10. So you want him to score from those ranges. He was extremely efficient in those ranges. If this offense doesn't get any better, if this offensive line doesn't get any better, can we, one, expect that touchdown conversion to be as high as it is, and two, expect this offense to be in as many positions to score as even they were last year despite you know this decrease in efficiency? So there's a lot of red flags that you brought up. He is you know, still fairly young. He is signed to a long deal. There's talks about him getting traded, but there's talks about everybody getting traded. There's talks about me getting traded. I'm not even in the NFL. So <laughs> if somebody voices an opinion, it basically gets spread as like real news when it probably shouldn't. So I wouldn't hold too much weight in that for now. Um, as Mike said, if you're not getting you know, an, a late first to like a very early second, there's really no reason to sell because he's still probably going to be a decent enough running back who is like the clear-cut starter. In Los Angeles. Now, the one thing I will say that concerns me is his passing usage. He had two straight seasons with over 80 targets this past year. I believe he had 48 or 49. So it was a, like an extreme dip right there. And I know Daryl Henderson isn't the best pass catcher out of the backfield, but what if they do want to get him more involved in that offense and just the overall that piece of the pie that Todd Gurley was housing like Eddie Lacy now becomes extremely small. So uh, yeah, there's a lot of red flags there, but I also think, you know, a guy his age, he's not somebody I'm just going out to you know push the sell button and in a startup i did i think he went like round nine or ten that's insane yeah you're hoping like that's basically running back 30 range you're hoping guys around that range yeah. end up holding a job that has half the workload that todd Gurley sees so yeah maybe he's a i don't know i wouldn't say buy just because his price is so low but if people are shopping him around don't be afraid to send an offer for him because he is like the consensus you know sell at this point and if somebody just wants to get rid of him you might as well just go snag him up especially if you're in one now type of contention yeah, fire out that 2.01, fire out that 1.12, man. See if it gets it done. If it does, you're still getting value. Like, you know, it's like Matt Kelly says, we don't hate players, we hate ADPs. Except for Derrick Henry, we always hate Derrick Henry. Yeah, we always hate him. But one thing, <laughs> one thing that we love in our last buy low for this part of the video is the 2020 Big Dogs Gotta Eat rookie draft guide, all draft guides for that matter. Go to bigdogsdraftguide.com. It's right above us on screen. There's three different options. You can get the Rookie and Dynasty Guide for $13.97. You can get the Season Long Guide for $17.97. You can get both guides for $27.97 for pre-order pricing. Extremely cheap. I know Mike, not, I wouldn't say cheap. That's not a very good word to have a connotation with. Uh, it's extremely <laughs> affordable right now. Value, guys. It's value. You just got to cop <laughs> that buy when there's value. Yeah, Mike and I and Nick have been working very hard on the Rookie Guide. We're going to have over 60 outlooks on players. We're going to update it throughout the draft process, throughout the combine process. Senior Bowl. We don't hold much weight in that. It came and went, and we didn't really care about it, as neither should you guys. Um, there's okay. going to be a lot of insight, a lot of you know, film breakdown, some analytical breakdown. Mike's got his numbers flying out all over the place. I got my fake film hat on or whatever people <laughs> say to break down prospects. We got some exclusive content like mock drafts, catering to super flex uh, leagues, tight end premium leagues, other exclusive articles like 2021 prospects. Um, you know, stuff like this, just breaking it down, touchdown regression, looking at rookies and the situation that they fall into, whether it comes down to the offensive line they're going to be playing behind or other things like their burst score or wide receivers breakout score to project 
a bunch of, you know, breakout players. So we really got that one-stop shop for your dynasty needs. If you want to get the season guide and you're really into, you know, fantasy football and you want to be year round, you want to make that commitment. I'm not great with commitments, but if you want to be, and you want to prove me that you're a better man than I, then go out, get that double package for $28. It's basically, I think it's like half price or something right now. So it's a great. Committed to your bunk bed though. What happened? You're committed to your bunk bed. Man, I don't know about that. <laughs> I think well, you I have am to be because of the show. It's but. our show name now. You have to be. And also, I mean, the last part, which I'm sure you guys will enjoy in the draft guide, is you'll have an abundance of Nick and Zendaya jokes because that's what we're all about here at, at Big Dogs. Yeah, there's some crazy wordplay in there. We kind of just got in our bag and went we went wild, but it's it's a it's a good ride. Yeah. A couple of my things you might have think I passed out while I was typing it, but be sure I was not under the influence. I was just in my own zone doing my own thing. So I hope you guys enjoy if you do want to purchase it. And if you don't have the means to do it, we are giving away a draft guide. All you have to do is either go on Twitter with the hashtag bunk bed breakdowns. Give us a review of the show. It could be negative. It could be positive. It could be talking about my headgear, which I will be rocking every single video. I don't <laughs> care what y'all say. I'm not shaving this hair until I get kicked off the show, which honestly might be next week. So if you want to give us a review, you will be entered into a draft guide. We'll announce the winner next week, or you can go on to the iTunes store. I think it's Big Dog's Got to Eat Fantasy Football. Leave a five-star review. Tell us why you like the show. Tell us why you love Mike's new smooth voice with that, that beautiful mic that he's just kissing over there. Shows how much he loves it. Uh, whatever you want to do, we'll take all you guys in. We'll give away a draft guide, and we might be doing this every week. So stay involved. Stay tuned. And we might switch up the hashtag just to make sure you guys are watching. I don't know. I might be mean. I might not. But if yeah. you want a draft guide, stay tuned. Yeah, just make sure you uh, follow both of us on Twitter and just use the hashtag. And we'll, we're going to pick our favorite one. It's not going to be random because it's our show. We do whatever the fuck we want. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we're gonna, if, you give, if you give us a good improvement, like we're going to imp- implement it. And you we're know what? Give you a draft guide. Also put hashtag BBB if it's not like too many characters. Maybe we can get. No, like- no, don't do that. Don't do that. Because, yo, oh my God, I got a funny ass story. Okay, sorry. This is not instead in the video, but. Basically, uh, I was like uh, going back and forth with those, uh, the ball blast girls, Kate and Michelle, shout out to them, uh, pretty cool chicks. Uh, and I used the hashtag, I was like, basically some dude is being like super sexist and he's like, oh, like, what are you like in love with them or something? Like, yeah, I'm in love with married lesbians. Okay, guys. Um, but basically I use the hashtag BBB to stand for like ball blast boy toy. And this like middle-aged like white lady came in being like, you can't use that hashtag. This is like trademark. I'm like, lady, it's the oh, internet. You know I can, what? I can say whatever the fuck I want. Hashtag BBB. Tag us. Use hashtag BBB. No more hashtag bunk bed breakdown. <laughs> BBB. We will get Lavar Lavar Ball on the show. We will get all the ball boys on the show. It's going to be incredible. It's going to be trending. People are going to think that Lamelo Ball stopped stealing from China. That probably didn't happen. People are going to think whatever the other one is is the first overall pick. He probably isn't either. He's got better hair than me, so I can't talk much, but. Hashtag BBB, tag us, give us a review. We'll give away a draft guide. You'll enjoy it. And we're going to move on to wide receivers. Yeah. Uh, so we'll go wide receivers. I'm not going to go through methodology again. It's very similar. The only difference is for wide receivers, I actually included uh, inside 20 yards instead of just looking at 10 and 5. And the reason for that is because, you know, there's more space, right? There's more route combinations, more trees. I'm not saying it's advantageous, but I'm saying it's better and easier for a wide receiver to score from 20 yards out than it is for running back. So that's why I included that. Um, so let's just knock these off. Number one up, your boy, A.J. Brown. Dude, I love A.J. Brown, and it hurts me to say this, but we talked about it last week, and I talked about these exact numbers last week. A lot of this points to regression, right? He scored nine touchdowns on the year, eight receiving, one rushing. Five of those, or four of those came from 50-plus yards, and then he also scored a 49-yard rushing touchdown. So five of his nine touchdowns came from 49-plus yards out. He only had eight red zone targets, which I believe is a 16% share. As we already touched on earlier, this offense is most likely going to regress not only as a whole, but in the red zone and their scoring opportunities. A.J. Brown is a phenomenal player. I'm not knocking him in any way, but I think the situation and the way he is used in this offense, he is way too heavily relied on to do everything himself. And year after year, I'm not so sure you can pencil him in for, you know, eight to 10 touchdowns. And if that isn't the case, sure, the rest of his volume may increase. But going from, you know, eight, going from nine touchdowns to five touchdowns is a difference of, oh, he wasn't ready. I four, baby. I'm, I'm a math grad, man. You can't, you can't sneak me with that Love stuff. that. Four times six, 24. That's a big drop off. You're going to need a lot of extra uh, targets, a lot of extra volume for that to offset. A.J. Brown, I'm a huge fan of his talent, but going as the wide receiver 11, I believe, you can probably flip him for a guy like D.J. Moore. I'm 100% taking the D.J. Moore side. 
Juju Smith Schuster is another one you can probably flip him for. Probably they're basically the same age, and Juju's done what he's done, but twice. So exactly. So yeah. I'm all on board with that. I don't have much more to add. Um, he's definitely uh, a risk in terms of a volume perspective. So let's just move on to the next guy. Amari Cooper is one that I actually cover in my thread. To me, it pains me to say this, big dogs. You know I'm a Amari Cooper fan. I love those smooth routes. But he's the most screaming regression candidate for touchdowns, both from a distribution perspective, which means he's scoring from too far out, and from a red zone efficiency perspective. Having watched him for so many years, he's not that great in the red zone. He's someone that like needs space to put guys on skates, but he's not going to like leap over someone and moss them, even though he should. He's kind of like an uber athlete. It's kind of weird that he can't do it, but that's not something that he can do. He's also you know got the ankle injury and all that stuff, so it's a lot of concern, and he still values a top 10 wide receiver. So, you know, if I can flip Amari Cooper for someone like Sutton, who's valued at like in the 15 to 17 range, plus another pick on top, like maybe a early second, late first, like I'm definitely going to be trying to do something like that. Or even like a Cooper for Diggs plus a little bit. And those are a couple of trades that I'd be looking to do for Cooper. Yeah, I love that. Uh, your analysis of that. And he reminds me a lot of the Andrew Wiggins, but like the NFL version, somebody who has all like the <laughs> athleticism. Your but... goddamn mouth. <laughs> <laughs> he just doesn't put it on display, although Wiggins had a pretty good game the other day. But whatever. Um, yeah, for me, Amari Cooper, not only the touchdown regression is extremely nerve wracking. And I know you talked about, at least I think it was in our Slack channel, that, you know, boom bust guys aren't always so bad because those high weeks offset the low weeks. But for me personally, if I want somebody who I believe can have a similar upside while having a safer floor I would definitely sell like for Cortland Sutton who's the alpha receiver who gets a ton of volume who is probably a little bit more consistent week to week but might not have the same upside I'm fine with trading him for you know a late first early second because we look at what Amari Cooper has done throughout his career he's played 76 games 38 of them he's had less than 50 receiving yards and with the Cowboys because you could obviously obviously say oh a lot are with Derek Carr that's why he was so inefficient 24 games with the Cowboys, 11 of them, less than 50 receiving yards. So basically another 50% clip. You're getting a lot of boom busts. Those boom games are huge, but those bust games are certainly there. And I know the injuries, he hasn't missed a ton of games because of injuries, but you have to think like his inconsistencies probably stem from that pain management of his plantar fasciitis. Maybe one day he's not feeling it. He's not up to 100%. That's probably why, you know, he slows down in those games. And the fact that he's dealt with that for a long time and it hindered him this year, you know, down the stretch makes me a little bit concerned, but yeah, his price right now allows you to sell him for a pretty good haul, like a Stefan Diggs that you mentioned that's, you know, a little bit older, or a Cortland Sutton who's a little bit younger, and you can get more on top of that in return for an Amari Cooper. Definitely. Next up, Darius Slay. Tom. I'm sorry, Darius Slay, not Darius Slay. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is another guy that I just threw on here, just looking at his numbers. He scored eight touchdowns this year. Six came from outside 22-plus yards, so outside the red zone. Four came from 35-plus. Maybe the Giants offense is just predicated on long touchdowns because Saquon Barkley loves to do it. Evan Ingram loves to do it. I'm just not sure, so sure that's a sustainable because you look at his red zone numbers. He only had six red zone targets on the season, which was a 9% share. He had less targets than Sterling Shepard, Evan Ingram, Golden Tate, Saquon Barkley, and the same amount as Caden Smith. And I think his name is Cody Latimer. I don't even really know that dude's name. <laughs> so it's not promising how he's being used in and around the end zone. And a lot of his fantasy value came on the back of touchdowns. He had two huge games. I think it was like 140 plus yards and two touchdowns leading the season. Jets. Yeah, and I think had him in DFS season. that week. Love Loved that. It. He's a sharp guy. He's a sharp. Uh, but yeah, and then the weeks after it was you know extremely down. And obviously you love those weeks when he's up. But he's another guy who, in an offense surrounded by talent, probably gonna be the third or fourth option. You're probably not gonna know when to start him. And he's a guy that super people are super high on because he produced as a rookie. If you can flip him for you know, a late first, early second. I'm taking that every single day of the week. I know Mike probably is too. I'm not yeah, so sure definitely. how yeah, his profile works out analytically with his breakout age or whatever, but I'm not, not sure well. that he's not well. Yeah. So I'm not so sure he's gonna be a huge part of this offense going forward, especially with the other mouths they have to feed. And they showed that there was only one game this season where Angram, Tate, Shepard, and Barkley were on the field together. And it was a pretty good game, but it came against the Vikings. And as we all know, the roads were open this year and it was <laughs> an absolute atrocity in the secondary for them. All roads lose fantasy points when playing against the Vikings. Yeah, I'm, I'm on board with you. If you can get that, you know, early second return in this class, I'm happy to do that, um, definitely. And, you know, he's been, a, he's been a, I guess, capitalizing on his opportunity, you know, with Ingram out. Love that dude. That's my boy. Uh, Shepard on his, like, I don't know, 99th concussion. The guy's about to be out of the league for his sake. I hope he is. And even Golden Tate got suspended for, I don't know, I guess, doing steroids or whatever. So, 
I think from that perspective, once all those guys are back, it's going to be, you know, kind of a, a big fight for the targets. And um, I just don't see the volume there. And he's kind of a very boom bust guy. So if you can capitalize on the second round, snatch it up, boys. For sure. Next up, uh, a fantasy favorite, uh, Nuke Hopkins, also known as DeAndre Hopkins. Bit of a disappointing year, I think, right? I think we can say that. You know, he that offense is weird. They like yeah. didn't score to start the game. They got like all their production in the second half. And Hopkins, and I know you'll touch on it, but he was being used like as a screen guy. And guys, he would like flash out for like five, six yards and try to run after the catch. And I don't know why, because he's extremely good, you know, in the deep game and contested situations and tracking the deep ball. It was, it was BOB being BOB. Yeah. It was weird. Like they were trying to, they were trying to like make DeAndre Hopkins Debo Samuel. I was like, guys, what are you doing? Like this guy, I mean, he's great, but he's not gonna like break ankles and like break all these tackles even though he did that like super funny twisting gif thing from a while back um but yeah his a dots like dropped significantly he went from 12.2 yards uh air yards per target and what that just means is like how far the bar- ball traveled in the air uh in 2019 to 10.5 in 2019 so that's a pretty big drop off it's over it's about 1.7 yards per target and that really adds up once you get to the monster target volumes that he usually gets and i think you know what it is is wolf fuller is more important to this offense than anyone thinks right wolf fuller is a beast like he's arguably one of the best downfield threats in the game honestly if you were to tell me that i could get 16 healthy games of wolf fuller I'd probably draft him as like a high end wide receiver two, low end wide receiver one. Like That's all he's been when he's on the field. The dude yeah, he's, he drops he's a, a lot of passes, but he's used so much that he makes up for it. Yeah, and because he's not on the field, like people have to centralize on on Nuke and like you know, Bob is like arguably the worst coach now that Jason Garrett got shit canned, uh, and he's also the GM. So it goes to show that you know you can be an idiot and do bad and still get promoted. So you know, all you idiots out there, you have hope. But in terms of like. I just don't trust that offense. You know, I don't trust that offense going forward. I just don't trust it, you know, at any point. Even though I love Watson, I'm worried. Like, I'm not selling. Like, I'm not panic selling Nuke because he's still getting the target volume and he's still finished as the wide receiver six, right? So it's not like he's a scrub and he provides you with the safe floor. But I just don't think the ceiling is there compared to years past. Yeah, and I think that's a common sentiment around, like, every fantasy circle is that, you know, he's getting older. Even though he's still 27, he'll be 28 by next year. And, oh, he didn't have a good year. Yet the guy, I think he missed one or two games at the end of the season. He was still phenomenal. The wide receiver six on the season and on a point-per-game basis. All he's ever done is produce, and he's just extremely consistent. So I'm not selling either. I, I would just hold him at his price. I mean, we we looked at, like, what he's done throughout his entire career. The last five seasons, he's had 150 or more targets every single year. And his finishes were wide receiver 6, 2, 1, 4, and 30. And that 30 came with Osweiler. And thank God we don't have to see him again. Have you ever seen that show, Shameless? I've only seen like Oh, that's movies. a great show. He, he looks like that dude Jimmy in the very beginning. <laughs> yeah. I put up a picture on screen. He's like a 6 foot 8 Jimmy from Shameless <laughs> with baby hands. That's so so that true. guy could not get him the ball. Now he has uh, Deshaun Watson getting him the ball, which is obviously a huge improvement. Uh, I might be a little bit higher on him than you are just because I think, you know, tethered to a great quarterback and he's still in his prime. Uh, I'm definitely not really thinking about selling him all too often, even though I did sell him in one league, but I don't want to talk about that. Uh, I, I, he's still going to be a very valuable fantasy asset going forward for the next, you know, two, three years in his prime. And he could have a very similar path to a Larry Fitzgerald, somebody who is just a really good football player as they get older, moving into the slot a guy who doesn't really rely on his athleticism and can still put up, you know, fringe wide receiver numbers in their later years because they're just an extremely consistent and extremely reliable option for their quarterback over the middle. He obviously has that rapport with Hopkins or with Watson. There's not like numbers to back that up. But you can just see when they're on the field, he wants to look for uh, DeAndre uh, Hopkins. So yeah, as you said also though, like if Will Fuller can ever figure it out, that's going to open up this offense. I don't know why they haven't drafted any like receiving threats to help this offense. They brought in Kenny Stills. I'm not so sure he's the answer either. Yeah. It's, dude, Sick name. Kutti, I don't know. I think these coaches are just in love with guys that have like double first names like KD <laughs> and DD. So I'm a little bit worried for CD Lamb, but uh, yeah, this offense, I'm a little bit worried as well. Obviously, the A dot is concerning the way he was used and how slow this offense started. Even the playoffs, uh, this kicked off game slower than the Chiefs game. They got off to a really big lead early, but yeah, if if Bill O'Brien doesn't leave, then maybe there's a bit of concern going forward for Hopkins. But as it stands right now, I'm not going out to sell him, but I'm also not going out to buy him because his price is probably a little bit lofty. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but if you can trade, what would you do this? Would you trade New Hopkins for DJ Moore plus a first? Oh, easily. 
I would. I thought you were gonna stop at DJ Moore, and I would have to think about that. What about DJ Moore plus a second? Yes, I would do that. Okay, well, I mean that. I I bet you can get that deal done tomorrow. Um, yeah, Scott and I love DJ Moore. Sent it to me. I love DJ Moore. So, and speaking of DJ Moore, he's our next guy. We'll kind of go a bit more rapid fire because I think those are the main guys I wanted to cover. But for Moore, he was abysmal in the red zone, but he was fantastic as a fantasy asset. He finished as the wide receiver 14 in PPR formats despite missing two full games. Uh, and he was basically, I think, seven points away from wide receiver 12. So he was a lock and loaded wide receiver one in his second year as a sophomore elite profile analytics darling like everything you'd want breakout age dominator athleticism like he's got all the boxes so in terms of building your franchise around him like i love dj Moore. i went out and spent a, like i drafted him everywhere when i went when i when he first got uh into the nfl and then i went on a buying spree just buying him up everywhere uh in the last season and now that's paying off dividends i actually did like a big study and on twitter in terms of voting and his price is like really high to the point where i'm like almost potentially looking to sell because he's valued right now according to like twitter and some other resources on dlf as like on nearly like a top six wide receiver yeah that's why i have him as a hold just because if i have him i want to keep him but i think his price is way too high at this price to go out and buy him so obviously if you can do that deandre hopkins deal we mentioned go out and do it but this guy's age adjusted production in the face of terrible quarterback play this past season is ridiculous. We look at what he did this past year. You know, he obviously had over 80 catches, like 1,100 yards, uh, not many touchdowns, but he was targeted a ton. There have only been 11 wide receivers in NFL history that before their age 23 season had 120 targets, 80 receptions, 1,040 yards. Those are arbitrary numbers, but I chose those numbers because it paces out to, you know, 7.5 targets a game, five receptions a game, 65 receiving yards a game. The only guys to have ever done it in their age 22 or younger season are Terry Glenn, Juju Smith-Schuster, Larry Fitzgerald, Josh Gordon, Allen Robinson, Randy Moss, Amari Cooper, Odell, Brandon Cooks, Michael Clayton. I don't know much about Terry Glenn or Michael Clayton, but I can tell you every other one of those guys was elite until like an injury took them out or off-field issues with Josh Gordon. But all those guys that hit that mark proved that they were extremely valuable. And I think DJ Moore doing it with Kyle Allen, who there was like talks about him being the franchise quarterback after a few weeks. That dude sucks. Will Greer. I don't even know if that dude's going to have a job in two months. And Cam Newton, who had no shoulder, no elbow, no knee, no sex in 2019. Like, nothing was going right, and he still (laughs) produced. DJ Moore is a guy that, if his price was lower, I would buy. But looking at what you just said, where he's being valued on Twitter and per DLF, like, his price is super high that, like, not to say that he doesn't have top six upside. He for sure does. But he's probably somebody who's going to finish in that, like, wide receiver 10 to 12 range for the next – however long and for that price i'm not so sure i'd rather i'd probably rather get like a chris godwin who was similar uh, yeah. similarly valued in those he was the only one that got ranked above dj Moore in that poll vote that i put out but yeah he in order to hit top five upside he needs to fix his touchdowns he's been atrocious both years so given it's only two years and given cal allen doesn't even know to throw into the end zone i'm gonna just chalk that up to bad quarterback play but if this trend continues then we might start getting that you know julio vibe um which kind of brings us smoothly into julio jones you know arguably the best wide receiver of this generation 31 years old probably has at least another one or two years in the tank uh you know i've been saying to sell julio uh starting last year and he put up another monster season Uh, i kind of operate under the better one year early than a year late and honestly it might be a year too late just based on like where he's getting drafted his adp his value but this year, he significantly overachieved his red zone efficiency. You know, I used to think that the narrative that Julio can't score was like just that a narrative. Uh, but I started looking into it, and the dude is just not good at scoring in the red zone. I don't know what it is because he's a total freak athlete, and you he's think he's very he totally... inconsistently there too. I, I looked at yeah. the numbers this past season. He had a seven game stretch with no t- or nine game stretch with no touchdowns. The year yeah. prior, a seven game stretch with no touchdowns, and in 2017, he scored a touchdown in just three of 16 games. So he's used yeah. very inconsistently in the red zone. I think there was a stretch, it was like a nine or 10 game stretch from 2018 to 2019 where he had like three red zone targets. It was, it was a bomb. It was an abomination, but looking at the numbers, he's not great in that area of the field. So maybe they know what they're doing. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, honestly, if you can sell, I would wait till in season and sell it to a contender and try and get a first back. Uh, And if you're a contender, you might as well just ride him into the sunset because he's going to give you wide receiver one numbers and just, you know, hold hands and hopefully you ride him to the chip. Yeah, he. I don't have much to add to that. He's exactly like Mark Ingram for me, somebody who, you know, if you have him, you're probably not in a rebuild mode. And if you have him, you're probably contending. So there's no point to try to sell him. 
when you know you're probably going to get at least one more wide receiver one season out of him, maybe next year, not this next year, but 2021 is the year he falls off. As we know, a lot of those big athletic wide receivers fall off a sharp cliff, like a, what's his name, Demarius Thomas. So I obviously think Julio Jones is a much better overall receiver than Demarius Thomas. But as Mike said, if you want to get out a year early and somebody's willing to give you, you know, a mid to late first round pick, I would take that. But if, if you have him, you're likely trying to contend and he's somebody that can help yep. you win a title next season. Yep. Uh, next up, Jarvis Landry. Uh, so this, I mean, he's someone that's just like, you know, it feels like he just constantly gets disrespected by he's the like really industry. good. And he's been better than Odell for like, not like in real life, but like for fantasy purposes, he's been better than Odell for like a long time because he's just been on the field and he's been, you know, productive. His finishes since he's entered the league are wide receiver 34 and then 13, 13, 4, 20, and 13. So lucky number 13, he's basically a back-end wide receiver one, high-end wide receiver two. He has seen a ton of targets no matter where he's went. His touchdown numbers in Miami were higher than they've been in Cleveland. But as we said, Stefanski is there. And I know you might be concerned that the passing numbers are going to be down. But we look at what Stephon Diggs this year. He had a great season. And it's not just because Adam Thielen, Thielen was out. I looked at the splits with him without Thielen. When Thielen was on the field, Stephon Diggs' pace was 61 catches, 1, 1,100 or 1,100 yards and eight touchdowns, which is basically what Stephon Diggs is. Without him, it was obviously a little bit better. And then when Thielen was on the field in games where he played over 80% of the snaps, his pace was 68 catches, 969 yards, and nine touchdowns. And it's very similar in Cleveland where it's a consolidated target share between two receivers and then two good running backs out of the backfield. I'm not a big believer in David Njoku. So we can see very similar numbers. If you know Jarvis Landry puts up 950 yards and nine touchdowns, he's going to return value because his current ADP is like wide receiver 31 to wide receiver 33. It's disrespectful for a guy who is, you know, I'm not going to say like in his prime because he doesn't seem like one of those guys that has a prime. He's just like really good for a long time. Like, I don't know, like a Julian Edelman, although his career has yeah. kind of started when he was later, but like someone who's just in the slot and he's going to be a consistent, you know, wide receiver 15 wide receiver 20 for you for the next three to four seasons. And if you can get him for like a mid second round pick or an early second round pick, I'm taking that because you know what you're getting out of Jarvis Landry. And it's basically an every week starter. I'm willing to pay a late first for him, to be honest. Like if you I would too. I mean, receivers you're that hoping range. that one of those guys, like one of those slot receivers, like maybe a uh, dude from LSU, what's his name? Like Justin Jefferson. Justin Jefferson turns, turns, into, turns that. into a Jarvis Landry. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then the next guy I just want to cover back to back is very similar. Robert Woods, Bobby Woods. Love Robert Woods. Uh, continues to be one of the most underrated and disrespected assets. He finished the season as a mid wide receiver two, again, getting drafted as a wide receiver three. It just doesn't really make any sense. He's the most versatile guy in that, in that uh, wide receiver group. Uh, and given the shift in the offensive philosophy of having more two tight end sets, no matter two tight end sets, Bobby Woods is still on the field. So Mike, he's getting, you want the big facts? Yeah. Hit me with the big facts. Yeah. You really want the big facts. All I right. want the big facts. The last couple of weeks, those last seven weeks of the season, Robert Woods was on the field 95% of the time or more. Boom. Five of those games. The games where he wasn't on the field for that many snaps, he posted six catches, 97 yards, and a very Robert Woods esque 13 catches for 172 yards and zero touchdowns. <laughs> so he was extremely yeah. involved. He was the only guy, even, you know, Cooper Cup saw his playing time decrease as they went to two tight end sets because Sean McVay thought having Josh Reynolds out there putting two hands on the defensive back is more important than having a guy who can actually get himself open in Cooper Cup. On top of that, over that span, the dude is averaging 7.4 catches a game, 94.7 receiving yards, and a great 0.3 touchdowns a game, which paces out to 119 receptions, 1,515 yards, and five touchdowns. Obviously, those numbers aren't going to – he's not going to finish with those numbers at the end of next season, but it's a good indication of how the team wants to use him. He yeah. kind of took over that 1A role to – uh, Cooper Cup's 1B, and we talked about last week with Brandon Cooks kind of being phased out as they moved to more two tight end sets. Robert Woods is much safer than Brandon Cooks because he's proven he's going to be on the field when they use two tight ends because I guess he's a decent enough blocker, but he's also a very good receiver who I believe is 28 years old, still in his prime. He has yep. seen 120 targets these past two years, 1,200-plus uh, yards these past two years. The only receivers to do it consecutive seasons over 2018 and 2019 are Keenan Allen, Julio Jones, and Michael Thomas. That's elite company. The dude is elite. If he scores more than one touchdown next year, he's going to be a fantastic option for your fantasy teams. Currently, I believe wide receiver 33 per ADP, yep. which is disgusting. Yeah. And on the TD front, like we've, he's actually grossly underachieving his TD as well. So when I looked at the regression from that perspective, you can expect some TD upside for, uh, for Bobby Woods next year, which is going to really push him up into that high tier wide receiver too. So again, him and Landry, 
it's like missionary, man. You know, people just don't want to talk about it because it's not sexy. Warm, but, but it gets it the gets, job done. Every gets time. the job <laughs> done, guys. Just sometimes you just got to be plain and regular, but it gets the job done. Trust me. Okay? Not a lot of effort, but you get production. You get production. Actually, so, hopefully you don't get production because that's a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the next thing I want to talk about, you just mentioned it, is Keenan Allen. And I honestly don't get the disrespect for Keenan Allen. Like, this guy finished as the wide receiver eight on the season, another top 10 finish, peppered with targets. Uh, actually underachieved from a TD perspective as well. So he's due for some positive regression on that front, even though he's not known to be a huge TD threat. And remember remember early on in the season when people thought Mike Williams was going to be the wide receiver one? Like, what the hell was up with that? Like, that Keenan was- Allen is still in his prime. He's a tw- he's 28 years old. And given the style he is, like, he's not athletic, right? This guy ran, like, what, like a 4.65 or 4.67 or something? He's a 4.72. I don't, I don't know. Oh, yeah, yeah, 4.7. So he's not relying on athleticism. He's just a pure technician. Have you ever seen – a uh, video of Keenan Allen play basketball, you'll actually see exactly why he's such a good route runner. He he's so quick. puts dude on skates. He is he's such good short area agility and he just makes linebackers look foolish. I mean, Pittsburgh Steelers know that well. They try to cover him with this with the linebacker every year, which it just blows my mind. But from that perspective, like he's just constantly disrespected. And I think you can get him for a mid first. And if you're a contending team in PPR formats and you're trying to win a game, like buy a wide receiver one for a mid round first. Yeah, I don't have his red zone numbers off the like right now, but I remember looking into heading into this season. I believe he had 39 red zone targets in 2017 and 2018 combined, which is really high for somebody who you don't think is a huge part of the offense down by the goal line. That's obviously because Mike Williams had a broken back one season and Hunter Henry just can't get on the field. But yeah. every time Keenan Allen is out there, he just produces. And I know this year is a bit up and down, but Philip Rivers was an abomination. And you brought up Mike Williams and Keenan Allen. There were like three dichotomies on that team that made no sense to me. Whether Keenan Allen was better than Mike Williams, whether Justin Jackson was better than Austin Eckler, and whether Philip Rivers was better than the dude cleaning the toilets in the stadium. Because <laughs> Philip Rivers is absolute garbage. I feel bad for the dude talking about him like this because he got a big family to feed and uh, he's no longer going to be on the team. But he wasn't doing anybody any favors. And you could say, oh, a quarterback change doesn't hurt Keenan Allen. There were so many drives stopped short because he tried to throw the ball deep to Mike Williams and he threw 20 picks on the air. There were so many game-winning drives. You know how many times I stayed up late at night watching these dudes play? And I was just so upset. That Steelers game, actually, they did lock up Keenan Allen that game and they were driving to either tie it or win it. And Phillip Rivers threw a 50-yard bomb to Mike Evans or Mike Williams. It got picked off. They called it back for a penalty. The very next thing, guess one. what happened? He threw it right back there and he got picked right again. So obviously, you know, Justin Herbert isn't a dude who's going to limit turnovers all too much but he's a guy who in the senior bowl showed he's gonna throw a lot of dump off passes if he needs to Keenan Allen is just one of the best blanket security blanket receivers in the entire NFL he's gonna be there for him over the middle it's gonna be longer drives because Philip Rivers isn't turning the ball over so much and Keenan Allen he kind of had that injury prone tag thrown on him although he tore his ACL dude everybody tears their ACL nowadays like you're not cool unless you tear your ACL in the NFL and he also lacerated a kidney. Like that does, you don't just have that become a recurring thing unless you're like Andrew Luck or you play for the Chargers, which is obviously um, a negative. But what he's done over these past three years, he's only one of three receivers with 1,200 yards from scrimmage, and he's one of five with 135 or more targets over that span. He is phenomenal. He's finished as the wide receiver three, 12, and eight. So he's basically been a wide receiver one, and I don't see that changing no matter who is playing behind center because he's going to give you, you know, that 95 catch, 1,200 yard, and five to six touchdown season. If his touchdown regression takes a positive turn, maybe, you know, seven, eight touchdowns, and he's back into that top five wide receiver conversation. And sure, he's a bit older. We've seen so many slot receivers produce into their, you know, early to mid-30 seasons that, you know, he's not a guy that relies on athleticism and gets himself open. He's just smart. He's a technician, as you said. Uh, He's not reliant on, you know, burning people deep. He's going to be, you know, a valuable fantasy asset for two to three years down the road. And if you're really looking for somebody to produce like six or seven years down the road, you're looking way too far because careers end early, sadly. And a lot of things change up over that span. So thinking too far out can kind of be a negative, in my opinion, for dynasty dynasty purposes, when you can get a guy who's going to be a wide receiver one for the next two or three years. Yeah, listen, I don't know about you, but I'm going to be scouting the 2030 Yeah, dude, there's this kid in elementary school school who's like got a really (laughs) nice dead leg, so. Yeah, I've been scouting him. He's my yeah. 2031 right, uh, yeah. running back one right now. I think that seven touchdown target is very realistic. If you look at historically, he converted at a 32% rate inside the five. This year, he converted a 22% rate. So you can get a couple of touchdowns there. And then inside uh, inside 10, inside 20, he usually converts at 26%. This year, he converted only at 20%, and he had like 20 targets. So very realistic target is like that six to eight touchdowns. And that's kind of push him, going to push him up into that like 
top or at least keep them in the top eight range. So at these types of prices, like the mid first, easy smash, easy smash. Yeah. And uh, I think we're going to just skip Mike Williams. I can't talk anymore about any charges. And I think we'll just head into the narrative, the new branded name, the narrative. Yeah. Yeah. So we used to call this uh, Twitter trends of the week. Uh, thanks. But thanks to uh, Jordan uh, Reigns. He's a, he's an IDP, IDT, IDP guy on Twitter. You can follow him at five zero shades of drunk. Uh, we'll put his Twitter handle below, but he kind of gave us this, uh, this idea and we're basically just rebranding the segment into hashtag the narrative. And we're just going to, you know, pick out some narratives that are going on in Twitter and let you guys know like what we think about it and whether it's true, whether it's not provide some insights. And this week's narrative Noah is just because a player regresses, you should sell them. What say you? Dude, this is like, it's basic economics and I don't want to get all like high and mighty, but if everybody is saying a player is going to regress, what is everybody going to do? They're going to sell. Then in turn, their price is going to get low and the people buying are getting a value. If you're selling Aaron Jones low because everybody's saying he's a regression, guess what? You're going to get him on the cheap. If you're trying to buy Leonard Fournette because people are saying there's positive regression, his price is going to skyrocket to an unbelievable height and his price increases. You're not going to be able to sell him. And those who do buy him are going to overpay and they're going to not probably reap the benefits from there on out. So just saying, because somebody's going to regress, obviously we broke it down more in depth today. So maybe, you know, you have a different outlook on things and you're not going to buy these players because all these talking heads are saying that people are going to positively or just regularly regress, I guess you could say. So just because consensus says one thing doesn't mean you should blindly follow it, do some research or, you know, look at more in depth things on Twitter. I know it's a great resource. Listen to us, man. Just listen to us. I don't want to pat myself on the back like that, but all right. Uh, I'll do it. (laughs) Yeah, you have no pro- that's I like that about you. I have no shame, man. <laughs> yeah, so just because a guy is, you know, set to regress doesn't mean you should sell them because the price is going to lower and just because somebody's positively going to regress or you think so, their price is going to raise. That's just, you know, how I view things and that's that's the main reason why I'm just not doing what the consensus is doing because in the end of the day, it either gets you really bad value from a selling perspective or a really terrible value from a buying perspective. Well, there you have it, guys. Uh, professor Noah giving you the Econ 101 breakdown. And yeah, the only thing I'll add... I was that good at Econ, but we'll go The only that. thing I'll add to that is, look, just because a player regresses doesn't mean they're trash. And I think that's like a concept that's so simple that people don't really grasp. Like, I see a lot of people like selling Christian McCaffrey. And I'm just like, they're like, oh, he's going to regress. Like, there's no way he can do this What's workload like 50% volume. 50% of the points he did last year, he's like RB8. Yeah, like I, I, I tweeted this out earlier in the year, but if CMC lost 20% of his carries... 20% of his targets and 20% of his touchdowns, assuming the same like uh, yards per carry and yards per target, he would still be the running back one with 58 points and 3.6 points per game over the running back two. So sucks. Like, he some guys are just so high up that even if they regress, they're still going to beat out the competition. And Patrick Mahomes and Lamar Jackson is another example of that. So like to me, it's like, you know, f- selling because of regression is like just, it's just, it's not ideal, right? Because you're at the end of the day, you're trying to win championships. So unless you're getting like outsized returns and really good deals on guys like CMC and, and Aaron Jones and Lamar Jackson, to me, I'm just holding them and just gonna like just gonna keep winning chips with them. I'm gonna try and go for three peats and two peats and whatever have you. So I think you just gotta like try and stay away from herd mentality. And you know, the big dogs slogan here is you know, fade the public. And you know, we live by that, right? You you know, you buy when there's blood in the water. And you sell when there's fish in the water. So those are just two things to keep in mind when you're going forward. Love that analysis. Now, I think this is the end of the video because we've been going on for way too long. I think this is <laughs> an hour and 20 minutes. So if you enjoyed, leave a fun thumbs up. If you didn't, I didn't bring any J. Cole into this this week. So hopefully there won't be that random thumbs up from that dude or <laughs> thumbs down from that dude. Uh, you know, enter into the draft guide giveaway, hashtag BBB on Twitter or leave a review in the iTunes store. Uh, give us suggestions for the narrative if you want to hear some other interesting topics next week. And I hope you guys have a great day. Peace. Peace.